Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, and thank you for those of you who are online for joining us as well. I want to say Merry Christmas to everybody, and uh, hope that you're having a good day and a good week. Now, you will if you focus on Jesus. Now, I think maybe the little technology problems that we had there were a good teaching point for us. Technology is simply designed to, help, to enhance our worship. It is not the substance of our worship. Do you understand that? The fact is, you can worship Jesus no matter if you have a screen or lights or sound system. Uh, you can worship Jesus, and we should worship Jesus. And I believe that sometimes we need to come back to that simple form of understanding that our focus is not to be on the things that surround us, but to be on Jesus Christ himself. I love the simplicity that we're able to have in Jesus Christ. It reminds me, that song that we sang, uh, Yahweh, I love that song. Does it remind anybody else of the islands? It just when I, when I hear that song, I think, man, I would like to be in the Bahamas right now. Uh, don't have to hear that song to think that thought, but a number of years ago, I preached a revival in the Bahamas. I was there in Nassau and uh, learned a very good lesson while I was there. Went uh, this church, they had advertised this revival and um, there were people that were going to come to it. The pastor assured me he felt like it was going to be a good week and there was going to be a good response from his church. Well, the services were supposed to start at seven o'clock that evening. I, I preached Monday through Friday and uh, I was still at my hotel waiting on the pastor to arrive to pick me up, to take me to the service. And it was 7 o'clock and I was still waiting. I thought to myself, man, this is going to be bad. Well, the pastor showed up a little after 7 and we chatted and uh, he was very friendly. And I just thought maybe it was one of those churches where the pastor just kind of showed up late, you know, just kind of a, um, you know, he was in charge kind of thing. And so I thought, well, we're going to be okay. But when we got to the church, there was no one there. And when I say no one, I don't mean just like the worship director. and uh, I, I mean, there was literally no one there. In fact, the pastor was the one that unlocked the doors to the church. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be a nightmare. And uh, so I went down and sat on the front row. About 7.10, the worship leader showed up and some of the singers showed up. And about 7.30, they started singing. And I looked around. There were about 12 people in the room. Now, the pastor told me there were going to be hundreds that showed up. And I was like, wow, this is going to be a disaster. They must have heard me preach before and they didn't want to come hear me at all, you know. Well, we sang until about 8.30. Remember, the service was supposed to start at 7.00. We sang till about 8.30, and I turned around and looked, and the building was jam-packed. I couldn't believe it. And the pastor was sitting next to me on the front row. He just leaned over to me. He said, you need to put away your American watch. <laughs> well, sometimes I think we need to put away our watch. We need to put away our understanding of all the technology, and we need to get back to the main thing and that is worshiping Jesus Christ. And I believe when we do that, we're going to have a great, great day. Well, today I want to talk to you on this thought, the night all heaven broke loose. Now, you've heard the phrase, all hell broke loose. And normally what that describes is a situation that goes wrong, descends into chaos, uh, or turns into a conflict. And we've all been in those. I remember the first year of being ordained and being in ministry. My wife and I had both recently graduated from Bible college. I'd been ordained. It was my first job, full-time job as a pastor. And I was the youth pastor at a church in Panama City, Florida. I know, tough job, but somebody's got to do it, right? But we were there by the beach. And so my wife and I hadn't even been married a year. Uh, we were out on the beach there one evening and we were enjoying one of the many dozens and dozens of little entertainment places on the beach there. We were going to ride go-karts. And uh, so I'm, we're in line. We're having a good time. We're with a, a friend, a couple of friends. And there's a guy that's drunk. 
He's obviously drunk. He's very loud. And he starts flirting with my wife. Now, keep in mind, I'm about 22 years old. I'd been ordained. I'd been trained. I was God's man for the youth of that city. But I was still full of vinegar. And I'm telling you, that did not go over well with me. So uh, he was, and I'm like, yeah, you need to be quiet, buddy, as I said to him. And he said something very inappropriate to my wife. And, and in full, being full of the Holy Spirit, maybe not, I looked over at that guy and said, you need to shut your mouth. And I said it just like that. And of course, he was not as big as me. And therefore, I felt the freedom to say that to him in that public forum. And he jumps up. You know those little rails that go back and forth, you know? You got to be in line to, uh, to get on the go-karts. He jumped up on one of those rails and challenged my, my manhood, challenged me. If it had been back in the Old West, it had challenged me to a duel. If it had been in the Middle Ages, he would have challenged me to a sword fight. But because he was drunk, he just challenged me to go into the parking lot and settle it like two men. And, of course, being God's man, uh, I jumped up. And, you know, I was trying to get to him, but I ended up having to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Finally got out of the parking lot. And, and I'm, like, ready to rumble, ready to throw down, even though I was a pastor. And um, all of a sudden this van, the back doors open. And the van had Alabama plates on it. Now, I pick on Alabama a lot. Um, and this is probably the root of all of my bitterness toward people from Alabama, okay? This, this van opened, the back doors open, and about eight drunk guys, and they were drunk, and there was a cloud of smoke coming out of and I'm assuming it was cigarette smoke because I'm a nice person, but I could smell it, and I'm, assu- and I'm telling you, it wasn't cigarette smoke. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, eight of them, and they were with this guy, and they surrounded me, and here I am, a preacher, okay? I'm a youth pastor. I'm in Panama City Beach, I challenged this little runt of a guy who was drunk and disrespected to my my wife, and now it's one on nine. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not that good, okay? You know, even the Toby Keith song, I may not be as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. That wasn't true then. That's not true now for me, okay? I wasn't about to be able to defeat nine people by myself. But because God's favor is on me, boys from our youth group, football players, two carloads of football players, some of them having scholarships to go to college, and they were a butt-kicking crew. I can just tell you that. They saw me as they were driving by, and they're like, Pastor Rich is in a fight. I could hear them say that. (laughs) And you may be wondering why this story is so long drawn out, because I was just kind of challenging them, hoping to God that the rapture would happen and God would just like lift me out of there and those, those dumb guys would be like, what just happened, you know? Well, these guys jumped out of their car and they started coming up and we had, I don't know, 25 people or so uh, ready to rumble in the parking lot of a go-kart place in Panama City Beach, Florida. Literally all hell was about to break loose. And before we could get God's blessings on us to defeat our enemies, the owner of this little go-kart place, and he was a tiny little guy, he comes running out yelling at the top of his voice and started pushing these guys from Alabama. I'm assuming they were from Alabama because they were in a van that had an Alabama plate on it. He started pushing them and telling them, I just called the police and the police were coming. Now, when somebody says to me, because I'm a preacher, the police are coming, I'm like, okay, cool, that's fine. Unless I've done something that I'm afraid the police are going to find out, right? And so, but these guys, evidently, that was the magic word for them. They jumped in their van and they took off and I did not have the pleasure of kicking butt. All right, so I just did not have 
that. Now, it's likely that I would have gotten my butt kicked, okay? But that is an example of all hell be breaking loose. You're in, a, you're in a situation and things go south. But even though you don't want all hell to break loose, you do want all heaven to break loose. And I'm going to read a passage where literally heaven broke loose on earth. And that is a beautiful thing. You see, when God turns our sin into his righteousness, all heaven breaks loose. In fact, the Bible tells us that the, uh, the angels rejoice over just one lost sheep that was found. And just understand that every time someone gets saved, when you got saved, all heaven broke loose. Whenever he gives beauty for ashes, whenever he turns our sorrow and our pain into joy and purpose, all heaven breaks loose. And let me show you where it began. In Luke chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, just three verses for our text today. It says, and this will be a sign for you. You will find, this is, by the way, the angel talking to the shepherds, all right? He said, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, don't you like those suddenly things that happen in the Bible? They were terrified. They were confused. They did not know what was going on. And suddenly, all heaven broke loose. You know that God will do the same thing for you? Because there are some of you, even this Christmas time, you're at the end of your rope. You feel like that everything is going badly in your life. You feel like all hell is breaking loose in your life. Just tie a knot in it and hang on because if you'll wait and you'll trust the Lord, he'll rescue you and all heaven will break loose in your life. Suddenly, God, uh, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Now, let me just explain what the heavenly host is. Throughout scripture, the heavenly host refers to the armies of God. And they're made up of his angels. And if you'll study scripture, there is, an, there is no n number, exact number given of angels. But in the book of Revelation, it indicates that there are billions, not millions, but billions with a B. That there are billions of God's angels and billions of his armies, billions of his hosts. So, so read that with me. And then suddenly a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Man, what a scene. Billions of angels suddenly begin to sing to these terrified shepherds. They began to lift them up. They began to encourage them. They began to point them toward Jesus. They began to give them purpose. And it says that his peace will go toward those with whom he is pleased. Do you know who that is? That's you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, you need to understand, God's not angry with you. Now I realize the scripture teaches that God's wrath will be poured out on those who are against God. And that's true. But it's their choice, not his. You see, what God did and the birth of Jesus began this. God became human so that he could die on a cross. Why did Jesus die on a cross? So that he could take all of God's wrath. All of God's anger, all of God's judgment for sin on himself. And he did it for us. And, and I want you to understand something. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, you've made a bad choice not to come to him. You know why? He has taken all, all of the anger, all of the wrath for you. And what he does in salvation is he gives us a choice. You can, by faith, come to him. He will justify you. He will redeem you. That means to buy you back. Uh, he will make it as if you have never sinned. He will say, I will remember your sins no more so that when he looks at you, he does not see your sin, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, why would you take the punishment yourself when it's already been paid for? Why would you take that when you've already been given the opportunity for it to be that free gift of salvation? So that's why I can say God's not mad at you. God loves you. So who is it, those with whom he is pleased? It's you. And I just want to point to you three things from this text that I believe give, these three things give us hope this Christmas. It, they give us this joy, this peace, uh, this ability to worship God. And we can see heaven break loose and in the suddenly things that the Bible talks about, God will suddenly in your life begin to give you hope again. Here's the first word. It's the word promises. Promises. God fulfilled his promises that he made to send a savior into the world. That's what the birth of Jesus is. Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. That's miraculous. And she will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God is with you. When you follow him, when you believe this beautiful story of God redeeming mankind, the gospel of Jesus Christ, God will be with you. That fulfills the prophecy about Jesus that was given many years before that. He was God, but he humbled himself and became lowly for you. You see, I want you to see today the glorious gospel that's found in this story. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is, a, this is a, a, one of my favorite passages because it describes what Jesus did when he became human. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And he's talking about being humble here. That you need to be humble. Don't be full of pride. Don't be full of yourself. But let God... Be number one in your life. Worship him. Be humble. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Let me point out a couple things in this text. It said he was in the form of God, and then he was in the form or the likeness of man. That doesn't mean that he was like God. It means that he was God. That doesn't mean he was like a human, but he became fully human. Okay, so I want you to understand that. So when you read that. He didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. In other words, he wasn't worried about what everybody else thought about him. Are you? Am I? Do I worry about what people think about me? I, I have to be honest. Sometimes I do. But he said here, don't worry. He made himself of no reputation. There were people that said evil and bad things about him, but he took it. Learn from what Jesus did. He took the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Do you know this? That when you come to him in humility, that's the only way you can come in salvation, by the way. You cannot come saying, hey, I'm good. Not compared to God, you're not. How silly is that? Uh, I mean, you're, you can't come to him and talk about you deserve heaven. The very personification of holiness and righteousness and perfection. No, no. God, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. When you humble yourself and come to him, he will exalt you. He will bless you. He will save you. That's what this is teaching. Jesus, he humbled himself for our sake and notice what God did for him. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Let me, let me just say this. First of all, Jesus is the way to heaven, the one and only, okay? God said here, Every knee is going to bow. Did you know that even if you reject Christ, even if you do not become a follower of Jesus Christ, one day you're going to bow. It'll be too late for you going into heaven 
uh, when you wait till after death to bow the knee. But one day you're going to see him as he is. And you're going to have to say, whether you became a follower of Jesus or not, whether you became a Christian or not, you're going to have to say, he is God. He is righteous. He is the Holy One. Every knee is going to bow. Of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself. He gave us these promises that came true when he became human. Isaiah 53 verses 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Do you remember that prophecy in the book of Genesis? When Adam and Eve sinned. And God said to the serpent, which by the way, interestingly enough, that Hebrew word is the same word for seraphim, one of the highest orders of angels. So when you read that story, don't reject it like some do, mocking it as a myth. Uh, This was whatever the creature looked like. This was a real creature. But it was Satan himself because that's what he was. Before he was cast out of heaven. And so uh, he said to that serpent. It says I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed. Who are the seed of the devil? Well according to Jesus it's those that reject God. Jesus when he was on earth said. That you are, are of your father the devil. The seed of the unrighteous one. But he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He said, you're going to bruise his heel, but he is going to crush your head. He's going to stomp the life out of you and you will be no more. Thank God for the victory that is found in Jesus Christ. He said, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? He put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Remember that back in the beginning, God said that there would be a seed of the woman. Now, we all know that, and that was referring to offspring, but there, the, the woman does not have a seed. The man has a seed. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And by the way, do you know who his seed are? It is every person that receives him as Lord and Savior in their life. And he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. I say so. Do you know how long his days are? They're for eternity. They never end. His seed is going to live with him. That's why it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It didn't seem like he was prospering when he died on the cross. In fact, I can imagine in my mind that Satan, the one that God told in the garden, one day my seed is going to crush your head. You're going to be damned. You're going to be crushed and ended I imagine that Satan himself, Lucifer, there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, it started in the Garden of Eden. He thought he had won the victory because he got man and woman to sin. And here Jesus was in a garden when he died. And I can imagine Satan thought, thank God we're rid of him. And he thought he won. I ordered a t-shirt the other day, and I love this little saying. I'm going to wear it, and uh, when I get it, it's not at my house yet, but it has on it this guy, this soldier with his head bowed, and it said, Satan saw me with my head bowed and thought he had won until I said, amen. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus wins. Jesus wins wins. And that is the promise that God gave. He said he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. He was satisfied with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Oh, the promises. You can have God's peace because of his promises.
Here's the second word. It's the word praise. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on this one. But heaven erupted in the praise of God at the birth of Jesus Christ. That tells me that Jesus is worthy of praise. That tells me that even in the middle of our confusion. Can you imagine how confused those guys were? Can you imagine how terrified they were? All of a sudden, I mean, literally, if billions of angels started singing at your house. Now, look, I realize that we like Christmas carols and Christmas movies and all this kind of stuff. But that's a whole nother level, okay? If billions of angels decide to carol you, it's going to terrify you, okay? It wouldn't me. And it says that um, they begin to sing and they begin to praise God. He's worthy of praise. Why is that? Because he's made some promises that he's kept. Um, This is referring to the heavenly army. This word, uh, these words here, uh, the heaven's host, uh, can refer to stars in the Old Testament. It can refer to angels or it can refer to God's heavenly army. And they praise God. The stars praised him. The angels praised him. Heaven's armies praised him. Listen to Psalm 148, verse 2. Praise him, all his angels, billions of them. Praise him, all the armies of heaven. We're to praise God. We're to praise God with our life. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts or the Lord of heaven's armies. He is declaring that by the Spirit of God, by the power of God, you can fulfill what God has given you as a task. You can be the person that God has called you to be. You can live the life that God has designed for you. You can praise Him. You ought to praise Him because He is worthy of praise. And then here's here's the last word. It's the word peace. It said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Talking about Christians, believers, those that trust him. That's who the Lord is pleased with. You say, well, I don't always live right. I understand that. God knows that, okay? Not that he makes excuses for us. He has empowered us to overcome the sin in our life, but The Bible tells us that Jesus knows our temptations. He was tempted like we are, yet he was without sin. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Did you know that peace is found in a relationship with God? That's peace with God. The Bible talks. I'm going to read some verses about this. And then peace grows through faith. That's the peace of God. So you can have peace With God, that's your righteous relationship of going to heaven, being saved, being a Christian. That's having peace with God. You've made your peace with God. But the peace of God is something different. The peace of God happens in those difficult circumstances when you need some peace. Amos 4, 13, For the Lord is the one who shaped the mountains, stirs up the winds, And reveals his thoughts to mankind. I I want you to see how Amos puts this. That among the greatest miracles of this universe. Look at what the Lord. He was saying God's the creator of the mountains. God's the creator of the universe. God is the one. They didn't know about DNA. They didn't know how many galaxies there were at that time. But everything they could see, they knew that God had created it. And he is great in creation. And you know what he put in there that is as much a miracle as the creation of the stars? Is that God reveals his thoughts to mankind. In other words, God wants to talk to you. God wants to have a relationship with you. I don't know about you, but that blows my mind. The creator of the universe. Not only does he want to have a a relationship with me in prayer, but he's going to reveal himself to me. You know, he ultimately did that through Jesus, but he does it to us through the word of God. He turns the light of dawn into darkness 
and treads on the heights of the earth. In other words, he is over all circumstances. That's what he's saying. It might seem like it's light and then all of a sudden it gets dark. He's in control of that too. That's what he's saying. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. He is worthy to be praised. That's who he is. And then um, in the book of Revelation, he comes with all of heaven's armies following him and he wins. And listen to what the Bible says about that. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out to you and we're done. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can have peace of God today if you don't have it. Romans 15, 13, may God, notice this, the source of all hope, uh, fill you with all joy and peace. How does he do that? By means of your faith in him. So here's the thing. You want more joy. You want more hope. And, and man, we need it, don't we? Some of you need it more than others during this time. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've got a bad relationship. Maybe you've got a bad health report. It doesn't matter what it is, but God says that he is the source of hope. When you lose hope, you've lost everything. He's the source of hope, and he's the source of joy. So the question is, how do you get more hope? How do you get more joy? I don't know about you, but I'd like a little more hope. Now, I'm full of hope. I have hope in Jesus. But, man, there are times I worry about things. I need a little more hope. And, and I have the joy of the Lord in my heart, and I thank God for that. But, man, I could always use a little more. There are times when I get grumpy and grouchy, and, and my wife has to remind me that I'm a Christian, you know. <laughs> and you probably get that, too. So he's the source of all joy. But he says you get it through your faith. How do you get more faith? It's real simple. Romans says, now faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You feel down this Christmas? Read the Bible. You feel like your outlook on your health is bad? Read the Bible. You feel like you're worried about the economy or your job, or you can insert anything into that blank right there. Read the word of God. God promises that when we do that, our faith increases. And he says, so that your hope will continue to grow by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you get more faith, here's what he said, your hope's going to grow. You're going to get bigger hope. You're going to have more hope. You're going to see a brighter future. Even if you're a negative person by nature, you're going to see a brighter future. Why? Because you've got the hope of Jesus in you. You want more of that? He says, read the Bible more. You'll get more of it. It's amazing how it works. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of, of God, not with God, but the peace of God, which past surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, notice what he said there, your heart and your mind. What is your heart? It's your emotions, right? So, you ever have bad emotions? God is the creator of all emotions. My wife used to accuse me of not having any emotion. And I was always correct her and say, anger is an emotion, <laughs> you know. But it doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman. It doesn't matter whether you cry at a Hallmark commercial or not. It doesn't matter if you want to watch a Hallmark movie, which they all have exactly the same plot. I can save you a couple of hours of your life. If you want to come to me, I'll just tell you what the plot to every single one of those movies is. And I know some of you ladies like them, and that's okay. Some of you men secretly like them. And uh, i got some questions about you that I want to talk to you about after the service. The peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. Your heart is your emotions. You ever get angry because of something that's happening around you or to you? You ever have fear? That's an emotion. Are you overwhelmed with sadness? It's okay to be sad when things call for being sad. But if you're stuck in that state of depression and discouragement, he says the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. What is your mind? What's well, the thoughts you think? 
You ever think bad thoughts? You just think bad thoughts about the way things are going to turn out. You're dominated by fear. He says that the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. How? Through Christ Jesus. That's how. So when I read the word of God, it makes me have more hope. It makes me have more peace. It makes me have more joy. It makes me able to handle the circumstances that uh, my emotions react to. It, It helps me to control the way that I think. It helps me not to give in to the way that the world thinks. You know what the Bible describes? And this is an Old Testament reference in Isaiah that the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians. He paraphrased it in the New Testament. And it's about putting on the armor of God. And you know what the number one piece of armor is? It's the helmet of salvation. You know what a helmet covers? It guards your mind, your brain. And when you get saved... And you begin to read the word of God. Here's what he's saying. You can have Jesus control that old noggin of yours. You don't have to be a victim of your circumstances. You don't have to give in to culture. You don't have to live in dread and fear. You don't have to think that everything's falling apart around you. Which, by the way, we do not live in the worst period of world history. (laughs) In fact... The argument could be made, and I think convincingly made, that we live in the best time uh, as far as technology and, and capitalism, raising people out of poverty. But you know that throughout the history of the world, the, there's been oppression. That's been, the main, that's been the main thing for the majority of people throughout world history. Oppression, having their rights crushed, uh, not getting what they deserve. That's been the way it's been throughout history. Just study history. And Jesus tells us that he will guard you even if it's not fair what you're going through. Even if somebody else is mistreating you. Jesus said that he will guard your heart and your mind. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy, carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants to be with you and bless you and give you rest in this time. Romans 16, 20, and I love this, just to show once again how Jesus, he's not, he's not upset with you. He's upset with the devil, and he's going to crush him. Listen to this. I love this verse. The God of peace will send, the God of peace, the God of peace. Do you get the, how funny this is? The God of peace will soon crush Satan. Mr. Robinson uh, is going to come into your neighborhood and zip up his sweater and uh, he is going to pull out his AK-47 and he is going to mow down the enemy. That, that seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? He's the God of peace, but he's going to crush Satan under He didn't say his feet. Now, why would he not say his feet? He knows he's got him crushed, but he's going to crush Satan under your feet so that you can have the victory, so that you are the conqueror, so that you are able to live the way God wants you to live. That's his promise to you and to me. That is something to celebrate, my friend. Thank God he is going to crush Satan under my feet. And then notice how he ends it. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. I love that. The God of peace. I'm going to kill Satan. I'm going to crush him under your feet. And I'm the God of grace. Just remember that. That tells me that I can live with purpose and power And then finally, the last verse I'm going to read, Isaiah 26, 3. You, Lord, give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose firm and put their trust in you. That's talking about our faith and the way we live. Keep your purpose firm. Uh, Just when you make a commitment to Jesus, don't waver on that. That's what he's saying. Keep your purpose firm. Don't let anything come into your life that is going to get you off course. Keep your purpose firm. Firm. 
decide that you're going to live for Jesus. When I was 16 years old, I'd been saved when I was an eight-year-old boy. And I'd grown up from that time in a Christian home. And I knew that God was dealing with my life about giving my life completely to him. And so I did. And when I was a 16-year-old boy, I gave my purpose of my life to God. And to the best of my ability, man, I've failed. I've fallen short so many times. I'm, I'm just simply glad that you don't know about how many times I've failed. But to the best of my ability, I've kept my purpose firm. And since that time, I've said, Jesus, you're number one in my life. Have I veered off course? Yes. Have I failed spectacularly? Have I sinned? You can bet your bottom dollar I have. Maybe I shouldn't say that when I'm talking about sin. Betting your bottom dollar. But here's the point. When you get your purpose firm, when you make a decision of the direction that you're going to head, here's what God says. He's going to give you not just peace. He's going to give you perfect peace. Perfect peace. Nothing like it. Nothing better doesn't matter how much of this you have or how much of that you have. It doesn't matter what this problem is on the right hand or that problem is on the left hand. He says, when your purpose is firm and you want to put your trust in me, he said, I'm going to give you something that no circumstance, no amount of money, no amount of success, no amount of prestige, no amount of exaltation, no amount of promotion at your job, no amount amount of fun that you can have. None of that can surpass what I'm going to give you. I am going to give you perfect peace. That's what I want. Not about you, but I'm sure glad when all heaven breaks loose. God made some promises to you and he's kept them. God has said Uh, that, you know, he's going to give you peace if you'll just simply trust him. He he said that you can praise him because of what he's done. And if you'll do that, all heaven is going to break loose in your life. And that's my prayer for you today, that you'll let God just break loose. Love that word suddenly in scripture. Suddenly, they begin to follow the stars. Suddenly, they began to seek out Jesus. Suddenly, God will pour out blessings in your life. Heavenly Father, thank you that you allowed all heaven to break loose on that night. Lord, sometimes I laugh about some of the songs that we write. Silent night. I don't imagine that was a silent night at all. If billions of angels were singing... And Mary was giving birth. Don't think that was silent. He was put into a manger in a stable around mooing and bleeding and neighing and all the noises that go along with being in a barn. Not very silent, but oh, was it glorious. It was a night that heaven began to break loose for us. And I pray that you'd help all of us to live in that, to lead with that, and to love that with all of our heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.